Hello and welcome. This is going to be lecture number five, all about the history of an atom. Go ahead, put the date at the top of your notes, and let's get started. All right, so I want to walk you through the development of atomic theory and the scientists that made it possible. This is by no means a complete list, but just a few scientists that I want to focus in on. So we'll start with this ancient Greek philosopher named Democritus, who lived around 400 BC. Uh, and Democritus is really credited with coming up with the word atom, which comes from the Greek word atomos, which is Greek for indivisible. And although Democritus didn't really do any experiments, he based his ideas off of the philosophy that although matter can be divided to be smaller and smaller, there's got to be a limit somewhere where something can't be divided anymore. Uh, and uh, for living so long ago, he was surprisingly accurate with uh, what we now understand are atoms. Uh, they are the smallest units that can't be divided anymore. Or at least if you do try to divide an atom, it will lose its characteristics if you break it apart into its individual uh, subatomic parts, or even just into the protons and neutrons and electrons that make up all of the atoms. All right, so much, much later comes along John Dalton, who wants to expand upon this idea that there is some limit at which you cannot divide matter any further without it losing its characteristics. But John Dalton finally starts uh, applying a little bit of science. And he's really focused on gases and mixing gases to create reactions. And what he notices is that uh, in, a, in reactions, uh, the proportions of the reactants to the products stays very consistent. And this is uh, a diagram from one of his early papers. Uh, one atom of hydrogen plus one atom of oxygen equals one compound particle of water. What's kind of funny about this is that that's not actually how that works. It's actually uh, two atoms of hydrogen, H2O, to create water. So he was a little bit off with the numbers, but he did recognize that uh, atoms had to be combined in certain ratios. Um, and that kind of gave him the idea that uh, they were individual quantized uh, unique um, units. So according to Dalton, the atom was just a featureless sphere that uh, didn't really have any, much else going for it. But it was J.J. Thompson that was able to take Dalton's idea of an atom and add to it. So he was able to use this apparatus you see here, which is a cathode ray being shot through a vacuum tube, to show that these atoms were made up of charged particles. And he was able to get a stream of just uh, uh, high energy particles to go through this vacuum tube by passing a current through a wire. And what he showed was that as that stream of particles passed by a magnet, it was deflected. That's what we see here. So if it's being affected by these magnets, then it must be made up of charged particles. Uh, more than just being made up of charged particles, he showed that it would, they came in two types, that there's a positive charged one that's really big and a negatively charged one that's really small. Uh, and uh, through some other clever physics of passing this both through uh, an electric field and a magnetic field, and then seeing how far the ray deflects, he was able to get the mass of these. 
Um, more massive would deflect less because it would have greater inertia. Less massive would deflect more because it would have less inertia. And he showed that the electron was about 1,000 times smaller than this positively charged particle we know as the proton. So important to know about Thompson is he discovered the electron using a cathode ray. Yeah, definitely write down that this is a cathode ray. And a really important part of it is that it has a magnet. Maybe even draw a very similar diagram to this uh, in your notes. It was then Ernest Rutherford who helped expand on uh, Thompson's theory of an atom uh, by showing that these positive and negative charges were not just um, in kind of a soup together. This is was called the plum pudding model because sort of like a pudding filled with fruits, the electrons were just sort of scattered about one big positive charge. Uh, Rutherford was able to show that uh, the atom is actually mostly empty space. It's mostly empty. Uh, except for this very dense region in the middle that we call the nucleus. And so how Rutherford was able to show this was he shot a stream of particles at some gold foil. And most of the particles went straight through unaffected to the other side, but just a few of them deflected in crazy directions, including straight back the way that they came. And so how Rutherford explained this was that the atom was mostly empty, but had this one super dense region called the nucleus, which was able to scatter uh, these particles being shot through the gold foil. So you do need to know he used gold foil in his experiment to discover the nucleus. The next scientist I would like you to know is Niels Bohr who further added to Rutherford's model uh, by coming up with the idea that these electrons live in quantized, very specific orbits. And the phenomena that Bohr observed was that when a, a tube of a very specific element like hydrogen uh, was excited with electricity, it would release light. So this is light coming off of our tube of just hydrogen. But it wouldn't release all of the different wavelengths of our spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, it would just release light in very specific bands. And so how Bohr explained this is that uh, the light is being released because electrons are moving either, or while well, they're all moving closer to the nucleus after being excited by the electricity. And if they can only live in these specific shells around the nucleus, then they can only emit light at very specific wavelengths. So the Bohr model is very useful and we will use it for a lot of the stuff we do in chemistry. But this scientist, Erwin Schrodinger, took the Bohr model and really turned it on its head uh, and is somewhat considered the father of quantum physics. So Schrodinger 
uh, in combination with other scientists like Planck and Einstein, were really interested in how uh, light sometimes acts like a particle and sometimes acts like a wave. And that light is not just a pure form of energy, but it's packaged into these things called photons. And photons are very interesting because they mostly act like just a wave through the electromagnetic fields that permeate the universe but occasionally they also act like particles. So we've got this wave slash particle duality. Now, Schrodinger said if photons, which we thought were waves, could sometimes act like particles, could Subatomic particles do the same. Could electrons, which we mostly considered as particles, sometimes act like waves? And there's really no reason that they can't. Uh, so Schrodinger didn't really do too many experiments, but just used a lot of math to show that electrons don't live in specific orbits around the nucleus, but they rather live in electron clouds. So electron clouds, and we'll just say mostly used math. And this is where uh, chemistry is its most mysterious is this idea that the electrons aren't just these particles spinning around a nucleus, but they're sort of popping in and out of existence within these clouds. And you can't ever really know where they are and where they're going at the same time. But this model works really well to explain a lot of the probabilistic nature of atoms. Um, and so it's been pretty well adopted that this electron cloud theory of where the electron lives uh, has pretty much got to be the right one. One discovery that often gets looked over is uh, James Chadwick's discovery of the neutron. So, so far, uh, we've been able to show that the nucleus is mostly composed of these positive protons. And then uh, around the nucleus are these negatively charged, very small electrons that are just spinning around, moving very quickly, uh, changing energy levels. And these were relatively easy to detect because they would be impacted by a magnetic field. So we could move them with magnets and see the result. But there's something else in the nucleus and that's our neutral charged particles that we call the neutrons. So neutrons have no charge. So how did Chadwick detect these if they won't uh, react to a magnet? What he did was he used this clever setup to strip away all of the charged particles and then add them back in. So by shooting this type of radiation that's called alpha radiation, which is um, it's two protons plus two neutrons, but we just knew it as alpha radiation back then. Uh, through beryllium, it would strip away those protons and there are no electrons in alpha radiation. So if you strip away the protons, the only thing that's flying through the air is neutrons. You can tell that, um, that they have no charge by holding a magnet close to the stream and seeing, does it bend it in one way or another? And this stream of particles does not react to a magnet.
Then the stream of particles goes through paraffin wax, where it picks up some positive charges. Uh, and now the stream of particles will react to a magnet. So if we put a magnet in here, then this would then bend. And we know that opposite charges attract. So if it, now if it has a positive charge, it would be attracted to a negatively charged magnet. And then that can be seen in uh, an ionization chamber, also called a cloud chamber, that Chadwick used to show that there still is a stream of particles that back here wouldn't have react to magnets, but here it did. Um, there was also some studies about the mass of these particles to show that neutrons and protons are about the same mass um, and can travel through the same amount of lead uh, is what uh, Chadwick used. Um, but very important, uh, neutrons, they help keep the protons together by providing sort of some packaging around them. And we're gonna learn a whole lot more about these elementary particles going forward. All right, I'll embed a few questions here to make sure you're paying attention. We'll call that good for this lecture video. Have a good rest of your day.